So welcome everybody. My name is Sal Berman. I'm the university's privacy officer and I want to welcome and thank you for being a part of Dissonance, conversations at the confluence of technology, policy, privacy, security, and law, an ongoing multi multidisciplinary uh, event series put on by a number of institutions around the university, which I'll refer to a little later on. So Dissonance seeks to engage the university community on timely topics of a national and global perspective, increase university-wide multidisciplinary discourse, connect faculty, researchers, and students from Central and North Campus. So I see folks from both sides of the uh, university. Uh, support university initiatives related to data science. So some of you may know that there's actually another initiative today, a big data and finance conference that Peter Swire was speaking at this morning. So thank you for doing double duty. <laughs> Um, and of course, provoke thought and discourse and have fun along the way. And so I can't emphasize enough the fun part. Peter is going to not only tell us things that are worth knowing, but it'll be entertaining with some inside stories of his time spent in DC. The series is made possible through a collaboration of faculty, staff, and students from across the university. Uh, that includes the Bentley Historical Library, the Center for Computer Security and Society, the College of Engineering, Computer Science and Engineering Division, College of Literature, Science and the Arts, the School of Information, the Law School, the Michigan Law Student uh, Privacy and Technology Law Association, and our own Office of Information and Infrastructure Assurance. So you can see a lot of folks are putting their time and effort into getting something really collaborative uh, out to you. So a couple housekeeping things, please make sure your cell phones are turned to uh, buzz or less. A uh, session is being live streamed, so we have cameras in the back, uh, and it's gonna be recorded and will be up on the Safe Computing website later. Visit the Dissonance website if you wanna sign up for future events. Um, and also, somewhere on here, yes, you, for those of you who wanna do some tweeting, you miss talks is the hashtag. Uh, you can also use Dissonance, that'll pop up. So today's Dissonance guest is Peter Swyer. Peter is Professor of Law and Ethics at Georgia Tech and an internationally recognized expert on privacy, cybersecurity, and the interworkings of government in those, in those uh, uh, sectors. Peter's been a leading privacy and cyber law scholar and government leader and practitioner since the rise of the internet in the 90s. And among other roles, has served as a member of President Obama's uh, review group on intelligence and communications technology and was chief counselor for privacy during the Clinton administration. More importantly to me, and aside from his professional credentials, Peter has been my mentor, a good friend, co-author, and the person that pulled me into privacy in the first place. So Peter, thank you, and with no further ado, take it away. Thanks. Okay, hi everybody. Um, so I'm gonna talk, my guess is for something like 15 minutes. First of all, sound check, you can hear me in back okay? It's like the mic's working, it's great. Okay, super. Um, uh, so I'm gonna talk for something like 15 minutes and then uh, we can do a lot of interaction. Um, uh, there's uh, plenty to talk about in terms of privacy, cybersecurity, the internet, and the stakes. Um, here's the outline of what I'm gonna do. Um, I have here a uh, pretty good document by the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. And what they did was write Clinton versus Trump comparing the candidates' positions on technology and innovation. So I'm going to work through what Secret Secretary Clinton has said. I'm going to work through what Mr. Trump has said on issues related to privacy, cybersecurity, the internet, and such things. Try to let you know what's been said by both uh, candidates on that. Um, I'm then going to uh, go into two topics where I have some personal uh, uh, observations. The first one's going to be the role of Russia and hacking and how that's been going in this election. And the second one is a very partial defense of Secretary Clinton on her emails. Uh, so uh, you can emphasize the defense, and, or you can emphasize the very partial. Uh, but uh, uh, so I hope that that'll be of interest. And then when we get to questions, um, you can open it up to different parts of my background. I was the privacy guy in President Clinton's White House. I was uh, I worked for uh, President Obama in 2009 and 10 during the financial crisis on various issues. I was back doing the review group on the NSA for President Obama in 2013, um, and have done pretty much every privacy and cybersecurity thing um, that there is. So you can then go broad on that, or you can go broad on the politics or whatever if you want to do that. So that's the, that's the part. So let's talk about what the issues show. Uh, and I'm just going to work through first the issues where one candidate has given clear positions and the other hasn't. And that's a lopsided thing, because just as a, as a mat, I'm, and look, I've worked um, a background on politics. I am not a surrogate for anybody here. This is me speaking, I'm not speaking for anyone else. 
Um, I did work uh, with uh, Secretary Clinton's campaign back in 2008 before, while that was going on against Obama, uh, and, and helped uh, with some, some documents and stuff. I did work on President Obama's campaign in 2008 and was part of the transition team after the election in 2008. Uh, and during that time, among other things, I was the lawyer for WhiteHouse.gov and for the new media part as they were trying to figure out how to turn their new media campaign stuff into the new media in the uh, administration. So I've been at the technology law interface. So it's, it's clear what side I'm coming from. I have views. Um, but I also want to give you an accurate read on what uh, I could find out about the two candidates' positions. So um, here's some issues where, where Secretary Clinton has um, has, has taken positions. Um, one, where there is clear uh, things for Mr. Trump is on immigration. We, we do know in the broad scope of things a lot more than we're going to talk about here on immigration. When it comes closer to technology, um, uh, Clinton has said that uh, she would favor giving green cards to foreign-born graduates of accredited U.S. STEM masters and PhD programs. So if there's somebody who came and did a STEM degree at Michigan, she would favor taking advantage of that expertise and having it available to the United States economy and having those people work here. Uh, that, that's, not, uh, that's more pro-immigrant, if you will, than, than Mr. Trump has been. So that's very specific. She's also called for support of STEM education, specifically calling for the training of 50,000 computer science teachers to meet the unmet demand among students for computer science education. I teach at Georgia Tech now. We have online masters for uh, computer science, and that can help train people at the master's level. And there's a lot of work being done to train high school teachers. But you have to tr teach the teachers. We have to somehow get from a point where any 10th grader will have had a decent ed education in computing. But we need an awful lot of 10th grade teachers to get to that. And so that's been a topic that she's uh, said uh, she would support financially for that. Um, in terms of innovation in the economy, she's said that there should be a chief innovation officer in the U.S. government. So one of the things that happens is there's regulations for all sorts of things, including privacy and cybersecurity. Regulations can slow things down for innovation. And so as a way to try to push against that, uh, she said there ought to be an explicit person in the White House with a role to push for the innovation part and not, not slow it down. Um, there has been under Obama a chief technology officer, chief uh, information officer, chief information security officer. So there's a set of people in the White House who are playing around this stuff. But the innovation part is something that, that she said should be, should be added to that. And there was just a story I read in the press this week that the Silicon Valley is about 98 to 2 in terms of financial support for, for her instead of for him. Uh, so if you like Silicon Valley, they, they like Clinton. So there you go. Um, uh, Let's see. Um, other topics, uh, she supported uh, expanding broadband to underserved uh, communities uh, and has funding proposals for that. Uh, so those are a series of, of places where she has, in her voluminous position papers on the website, clear statements on topics that he hasn't spoken about. Here's some other topics, and I'll build up to, to so net neutrality. People know net neutrality here, at least, that, you know, okay. She's in favor of net neutrality. Let me get the quote, for, which is now the law and has been upheld in the DC Circuit. Um, for those of you who don't know that jargon, very roughly speaking, you're, you're on the edge of the internet. You or your small business or your big business is going through, who, I don't know who the major, who's the major um, ISP for people in Michigan? Comcast, you're going through Comcast. Um, so Comcast as a business might like the idea of making a deal with Netflix to have Netflix stream faster to your house. And, and that would uh, get Netflix to your house faster. But it would mean, by comparison, all the other people who didn't have a deal with Comcast would go slower. So that's not neutral. It would be faster download for Netflix. Net neutrality says Comcast has to let everybody through on the same terms. And, th and that way, the companies on the edge don't negotiate with Comcast in the middle. Um, so let's see, page 16. Okay. Um, Trump has expressed displeasure with the FCC's open internet order, tweeting that, so that makes it official, Obama's attack on the internet is another top-down power grab. Net neutrality is the fairness doctrine will target conservative media. So he doesn't like net neutrality. Um, he thinks it's a regulatory uh, imposition. Um, let's see. Let's go to some of the cybersecurity. Oh, another topic. Um, there's been a, 
just in the last several weeks, there's been a change in ICANN and how internet numbering goes. How many people have heard about the IANA transition or ICANN? So this is a relatively nerdy tech audience. We're, we're almost up to half who, who have that. We could do a little test on what ICANN stands for or IANA. I might flunk, but anyways. Um, let me, so um, I'll do this in about one minute. I was just on a panel on this earlier this week. Um, it's really helpful when you have an internet that when you type in an IP address or you type in google.com, that it roots to the right place. And so there's a bunch of infrastructure to make sure that we assign IP addresses to people, that we assign domain names in a structured way. Um, back in the 90s, there were professors, there was one famous professor at UCLA who basically ran that out of his basement when the internet was small enough before the commercial internet, Dr. Postal. And then over time, in the 90s, they built this thing, ICANN, which was a nonprofit corporation from California that was set up in a contract with the US Department of Commerce to run that globally for the internet. Now, that made sense because US was innovating and the internet had a big fraction of it was the United States in 1996, 97. But let's say France today thinks it's pretty weird you'd run the internet out of a nonprofit corporation that's run under the supervision of the US Department of Commerce. So as an international thing, that seems a little weird. And there's also, uh, and so the basic story that happened is, um, after lots of negotiation among lots and lots of stakeholders globally, the idea was that, the, that it would transition from this kind of structure with the Department of Commerce looking at everything to a new structure with a bunch of accountability mechanisms that includes people from other countries but basically, um, the people who are stakeholders will be the ones watching the process to make sure it runs right. I'm not sure I described that great. In any event, that happened as of October 1st. That is now done. So now we're, we're three weeks into the new thing. Has anybody noticed a change in the internet since October 1st? No, I mean, it's like asking if, well, anyways, won't go there. Um, OK, so um, uh, Mr. Trump said this is terrible. It's, an, it's a giving up of US sovereignty. And that's consistent with a sort of, you know, don't go globalism. So to some extent, what happened here is uh, the Obama administration and Secretary Clinton are more globally willing to share with partners internationally. And there's a bunch of reasons why, in the long run, I believe the internet will be better for that. Uh, but it's, it's an example of a difference between the two candidates. And we can come back with questions later if you want any of this stuff. Um, here's something they both have said on the internet, which is different from the old days. They both appear to be open to letting local governments have a bigger role in online sales tax. So if you buy from Amazon, instead of buying from the business down the street, Ann Arbor gets less sales tax. And as so much commerce goes online, that deprives municipalities of a big part of their sales tax. And so there has been, for the, since the 90s, a no sales tax to the locals rule, but increasingly, more people, and in both of the candidates, are at least open to finding ways where some of the sales tax gets sent back to Ann Arbor instead of uh, Amazon being sales tax free. So that's something that's coming on all this. So trying to give you facts on different things that you might not have heard about. OK, uh, page 19. Cybersecurity, which was in the first debate, right? That's, you know, there weren't very many issues that both of them talked about and stayed on the issue. Both of them talked about cybersecurity during their two minutes on cybersecurity. So I don't, I don't know what that says. I think one thing it says is that um, cybersecurity at heart is not a, has not been a partisan issue particularly. So Clinton has stated she will expand investments in cybersecurity and encourage public-private partnerships to encourage cybersecurity innovation and information sharing. Those are themes that have been big themes for President Obama's administration. And she promises to build on the current cybersecurity national, national action plan, such as more authority for a federal chief information security officer and upgrading federal IT systems. That's a sort of bureaucratic way of saying we should keep trying to incrementally build up the infrastructure to share between public and private. Uh, Mr. Trump has argued the United States has obsolete cybersecurity capabilities and that it is falling further behind other countries. I'm not sure who is falling behind, but he's falling behind certain unspecified other countries. Uh, and he, to address that, his answer is we have to quote, cyber has to be in our thought process, close quote. And he's also vowed to quote, enforce stronger protections against Chinese hackers. And our responses to Chinese theft will be swift, robust, and unequivocal. Um, 
some of you may know if you follow this, that the current administration has indictments they brought against some uh, military officers in China for, that they were able to track down and attribute cyber attacks to. So there's been a lot of intellectual property theft from China. Um, I, I think both candidates um, will, will try to push back on that. Um, but that's what they've said on cybersecurity. Uh, encryption, an issue I've, I've uh, followed for a long time. You, you all remember Apple FBI, and, and it was a few months ago. But um, here are the statements. Mr. Trump said that he agreed with the court order calling for Apple to get access to the iPhone, and he called for a consumer boycott of Apple products until the company opened the phone and cooperated with law enforcement. So a lot of people in the tech community think if you break crypto, and I do, that if you break crypto for the FBI here, you're breaking crypto that other people can also get into. And that's the strongest or a particularly strong argument about being careful with that. Um, uh, uh, Secretary Clinton, um, I would say, is trying to split the baby on this one. She supports the idea of establishing a national commission to magically study, sorry, to study how to address the needs for law enforcement while protecting the privacy and security of Americans and advancing our competitiveness. So there, there's been proposals for a commission. The National Academy of Sciences is doing a study right now on how to do some of these things, so maybe that, that almost qualifies. And she's also called for a Manhattan-like project where the government and tech community would work together to develop a way for law enforcement to gain access to encrypted. And, and this, my own view, having been around crypto policy for a lot of years, is people are asking for ways to square the circle. They ask for ways to get in for the good guys and not get in for the bad guys. And she's trying to say, well, we should study it and come up with good plans that will somehow do both. And he's saying, lean towards the law enforcement national security agencies to give them access. That's roughly the, the statement of what they've said on encryption. Um, and then let's do ISIS and the Patriot Act uh, to wrap up, and then I'll switch to other topics. Um, online speech, think of it as uh, ISIS recruiting. So Clinton has stated that internet freedom is a core value for open societies, and she has pledged to promote that value at home. But she's also argued the government should work with the tech community to deprive jihadists of virtual territory. I'm not sure how that codes into tech words, but depriving jihadists of virtual ter territory. And she says, this is complicated. You're going to hear all the usual complaints. You know freedom of speech. But we, if we are truly at a war against terrorism and we're truly looking for ways to shut off their funding, shut off the flow of foreign fighters, then we've got to shut off their means of communicating. So I'd say that's, that's pretty far towards a hawkish, hey, Facebook, Twitter, help us with this. We've got to find a way to crack down on this. Uh, Trump uh, has repeatedly stated that he wants to work with the tech industry to find ways to prevent ISIS from recruiting online, stating, I would certainly be open to closing areas where we are at war with somebody. That's sort of like not allowing immigrants in. We're going to close the internet, apparently, for, er for areas where we're at war with them. Quote, I sure as hell don't want to let people that want to kill us and kill our nation use the internet. And he also said, in response to concerns this might not be constitutional, he stated, quote, somebody will say, oh, freedom of speech, freedom of speech. These are foolish people. We have a lot of foolish people. So I, I'm reading from a document. I didn't write the document. This was their attempt, in, I think, in good faith to get the most detailed statements from both uh, candidates about these issues. And was there one more? I think there was. Sorry. Uh, b -b 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 crypto cyber security. Oh, Patriot Act. OK. And then government surveillance, uh, which is the topic we did a lot in the review group. The review group said we should change a bunch of things, including closing down the Section 215 database. That was the database of domestic phone calls collected for foreign intelligence purposes. And um, that was closed down under a law called the USA Freedom Act, passed by the Republican House, passed by the Republican Senate, signed by President Obama. And it adopted a lot of our recommendations to update surveillance laws and, and not have this bulk collection on uh, phone records on domestic support. So Clinton has supported the USA Freedom Act, which was passed in 2015. Um, and in addition, when I, when that's, a, that's a detail that I care about. OK. Uh, Mr. Trump uh, has said he wants to restore all the powers from the Patriot Act from 2001. So that was a more broad uh, a surveillance set of authorities. Uh, he also said, quote, I assume when I pick up my telephone, people are listening to my conversations. That's at least true for his bus conversations. Anyway, if you want to know the truth, it's pretty sad commentary, but I err on the side of security. And he has called for a database on the people coming in from Syria and surveillance of mosques. Um, 
that is, that's what I have to report on what the two candidates have said publicly on the tech issues. Um, as I say, I have my views. I tried to give you the facts um, on that. Let me talk about Russia and then talk about emails. Um, so in May, I was on a delegation to Moscow for cybersecurity talks. Since the Ukraine and Crimea invasion, the US government has had sanctions. And so we were sort of the unofficial people going to Russia to talk to him about this. Michael Chertoff, you might have heard of, former Secretary of Homeland Security, led the delegation. And I left uh, after these meetings feeling like these folks were not telling me the truth about basically anything. Uh, I just, like, they, they just smiled and would say the most amazing things. Um, a few weeks later, we got news in the press that the Democratic National Committee had been hacked. And there is very detailed attribution for this, in my view. So if you want to look at the most detailed stuff, there's a company called CrowdStrike, which has a very detailed, here's what happened. It has to do with uh, facts about a particular hacker handle called Guccifer. Um, you may have heard about if you're, if you're deeply into this. Um, and then um, there was a second round of attacks uh, that have to do with uh, John Podesta, somebody I used to work with in the first Clinton administration and after that. And John fell for a phishing attack, according to what's now been put in the press. It was a spear phishing attack, a highly tailored uh, attack. It now is the case that if you're a public official or a senior corporate official, you may, you should probably now assume that you are going to be personally targeted because you might have interesting stuff. Um, so, you know, that's just, so his, his uh, Gmail or whatever account was hacked. And uh, since then, we've had uh, thousands of these emails re released from WikiLeaks. Um, so there's been a lot of reporting done on did WikiLeaks get it from Russia? And I think the overwhelming uh, evidence is they did. WikiLeaks gets stuff from a lot of places. They got it from private first class Bradley Manning uh, when Secretary Clinton was in the, in the State Department and, and they released a lot of stuff. So there's a tremendous amount of evidence that um, WikiLeaks was get, is getting it from basically Russian government supported hacks or at least Russian provenance hacks. The, the next, so, so DNC taken down, WikiLeaks working with Russia at least to, to publish the things on a schedule related to the election. And then th th that I think is just like, like I'm way above 90% uh, likelihood on. The part that's into the conspiracy theory part is did Roger Stone know about it and is it part of it? So Roger Stone is one of the major Trump supporters and, and um, uh, confidants. And uh, during the course of the fall, Stone on more than one occasion has been saying WikiLeaks is going to be doing this stuff before it was released and before other people knew it. So you can look that up and look at the documentation on it. And I, I think there's pretty good evidence that WikiLeaks was talking with Roger Stone, at least saying, hey, heads up, Roger, this stuff is coming. Um, I don't think we have evidence that he was asking them to do it on behalf of Trump. Um, but there's evidence that WikiLeaks was giving some kind of heads up to the, this Trump confidant. Um, so there's all this back and forth about, is it Russia and, and all that? Russia's been involved in having the leaks happen. There likely has been some kind of conversation, at least one way, between WikiLeaks and the Trump campaign. I think that's documented. Um, today, um, uh, Trump uh, uh, said that Secretary Clinton's been too hard on Putin in a new speech. You can go look that up. Now, that's, um, and he famously said he would support having Russia or anyone else get the emails out if we could get more facts about what Secretary Clinton's been doing. So the critique there is um, a candidate for president asking a foreign nation who's often an adversary to attack a US person. That's a, that's a strange thing. Like, come bomb us, you know, because I don't like my opponent. Come cyber attack our opponent. Uh, I think that's. I think that's remarkable. Um, now, I want to, for a minute, talk about um, Russia from a different way that you might not expect. Uh, and this is partly from, from visiting in May. So here's, I think, uh, at least a story that's a plausible story about how Russia has looked at the last several years and why Russia is pushing back so hard. So if you look at Russia over the centuries, how many people here have sort of studied Russian history ever, done much stuff on that, sort of a little bit? So a few of you. So I, th I think what I'm saying is just pretty much change. So Russia for years, because it's a, a flat land mass, has felt paranoid about people attacking them. Napoleon attacked him, Hitler attacked him, Genghis Khan attacked him. There's a, there's a long history of this. 
And so the Russian strategy geopolitically for years is to build buffer states around the core of Russia so that if the attack happens, they might only take the first 500 miles and not get all the way to Moscow. Um, think about how the world's changed since 1989 when the wall came down. Eastern Europe stripped away. Eastern Europe, part of the European Union, way hooked to the West. Then the breakup of the Soviet Union into the republics, Lithuania, Lithuania Latvia, Estonia, um, being talked about as NATO partners. Ukraine being talked about as a NATO partner. Ukraine is deep into the space that Russia has controlled for centuries. Crimea was the only warm water port. So if you're sitting in Moscow, you're looking at the map, and suddenly those people that were literally over 1,000 miles away are in your neighborhood. And that gets your fear and paranoia going at a really high level. And, um, and, and the talk about Ukraine being even more closely hooked into the West is very worrisome if you're the paranoid person sitting in Moscow wondering what's going to happen next. So one possibility for Mr. Putin or others sitting in Moscow is to be really worried and then to act more aggressively to somehow push back. And one sign of that aggression could be these cyber attacks which is also part of, is consistent with their technique for disinformation and stuff like that that they do. And there's a genuine question, because they have nuclear arms and armies and stuff like that, of what's the best way to handle Russia if they're getting into this super paranoid aggressive frame of mind. So one thing you might say is we want to basically push democracy as far east as we can. We want Russia to become a democracy again. Let's support Ukraine and all this kind of stuff. Another is that that's basically threatening to Russia and increases the risk of conflict going forward. So I, I think that people who are thinking about the Russia-US relation can and should have a real discussion about the best overall posture so that we get a lot of democracy and freedom and economic growth and we don't have a twitchy finger on the nuclear trigger. So I'll just say that there's a story to be told about Russia, which is pushing harder is not always the right answer. And, and, but so, and, and to that extent, there's a case to be made in the direction of what Trump's saying to at least try to figure out ways to work more closely with Russia, as well as a case of standing up for human rights and for expanding the zone of democracy, which Secretary Clinton's more aligned with. So I just offer that as something on Russia. But in the meantime, asking the Russians to attack your political opponent with tools of war, to me, is outrageous. And if you want to read... Um, Michael Morell was one of the five people in the review group. You might have seen him on TV. He's a former head of the CIA. And he wrote an op-ed in the New York Times that basically laid out how Trump is acting as an agent for the Russians. This is even before the last Roger Stone stuff. And how um, it undermines America's national security. So if you want um, to, to see that perspective, look for Michael Morell talking about this. Let me give the uh, partial or very partial defense of the emails and then... Oh, I talked longer than I meant to, but we'll have plenty of time for questions. Um, so let's imagine that you're a parent and you'd like to talk to your daughter by email and get baby pictures and ask how she's feeling and complain about how your day went. You can imagine parents having that idea. And then let's imagine that you're in a job where you're at the work computer all the time and it's going to be a public record revealed to everybody in the world. And you're like, that's stupid. I want to talk to Chelsea. I want to send baby pictures. I want to be able to ask how she's feeling today after that embarrassing thing that happened yesterday. So having, I, I have sympathy for a person, and I've worked in the White House behind the screen, and all, I have sympathy for a person wanting to have a private way to communicate with the private part of her life. Um, there's another uh, 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 thing, which is having worked on the transition for whitehouse.gov, in 2008 and 9, when we came in, the infrastructure was awful, right? Obama couldn't get a, a, a BlackBerry to do email for months because there was no infrastructure. Whitehouse.gov, for Bush, it was like a backwater that was technically six or eight years behind the state of the art. The State Department was known in its email server to be owned by the Russians in, in its unclassified system when, when Secretary Clinton came in, and you can find evidence of that. So, Using the State Department unclass email system was stupid for anything serious at the bad level of preparation she walked into. And if she could have a different structure outside of that, there was a decent case, initially at least, that it might actually be better 
more secure, not already owned. Um, and she still wanted to get the baby pictures. Um, so that's, that's a, some context you wouldn't have. The other thing about deletion that, that you can say is, um, I work with a law firm uh, consulting a day a week in addition to being a professor, and our emails are deleted on, an, on a schedule, and it's pretty soon. Unless you save an email in a different place, they automatically delete the emails after a certain time, because in litigation and everything else, it's a big mess if you keep that stuff around. Um, so that's one set of things. There actually were some reasons for her to want to have a private email thing. Um, by a year or two or four in, they should have just cleaned up the State Department email and gone to that, and they didn't. So that I don't defend. Let me talk about a couple of other aspects about why her actions were not as bad as they seem, even though, in retrospect, they were like really stupid. One is, there's a huge difference in government between the unclassified email system and the classified email system. So if you work in a SCIF, a secure facility, on the classified email system, you're not allowed to have your phone in the room when you do it. You're not allowed to take the equipment out of the secure physical place. That's the classified email, and you're supposed to receive and send classified email on your classified system. And you tell it's a classified system because you're in the room, and it says classified on the computer. OK? It's pretty easy to tell. Over here is the unclassified system that the Department of Agriculture and the Department of State and the White House and everyone else uses for unclass emails. And no one's supposed to send you classified stuff there. And you're not supposed to take stuff smuggled out of the skiff and put classified stuff there. This is unclassified land. And when you're in unclassified land, people can send you emails that say all sorts of stuff. And then you see the email and say, oh, print it out. As criminal acts go, that is not a criminal act. You're on your unclassified system doing unclassified stuff. So now the question is, wasn't a bunch of that stuff classified? And there's two basic answers to it. The first one is, a bunch of that stuff, once people went and looked at it afterwards, in the views of at least one agency, should have been classified, right? because it's talking about, I don't know, a drone attack or something like that. And so the person who sent it never should have sent her stuff that was, in retrospect, deserved to be classified, but at the moment it was sent and received was unclassified. And there's lots of those. There's hundreds and hundreds of emails that at least one agency has gone back and said after the fact should be classified. The second is there is a small number, which I think is three, where in the unclassified email, somebody had, which you're not supposed to do, cut and pasted from the classified system. And so there was markings that basically were slash C for classified. So you're reading all your emails in your inbox. And it says, Chelsea's baby picture. It says, drone attack. It says, we don't like Iran today. They did this thing. And in paragraph three, there was a slash C that said this next paragraph from that marking, you should maybe, if you notice the slash C, think that that's classified. That was the notice of classified emails to her in the emails, as far as I can tell, having spent a bunch of time on it. You know, so she knew she had class, she received things that were marked classified, yes. But wow, you're way over in unclassified land. You're not on the classified system, and you're just trying to get your job done as you're moving on to the next meeting. The other uh, defense uh, of it is that the people who get criminally prosecuted for this stuff all basically do the following thing. They go into a skiff and they take stuff, you see you shouldn't do it, you take stuff out of the skiff. That's what Sandy Berger did when he got in trouble when he's national security advisor at the end of the, right after the Clinton thing. So this is a willful violation of law. You take stuff you know is classified and you take it to unclassified land. And you know that's not an accident. You know you're doing it. That's not the same as receiving an email on Chelsea's baby update and drone attack and not saying, stop, I shouldn't be reading this, and I need to report it. So that's the biggest single difference legally to me between the people who got prosecuted and receiving lots of unclassified emails. But she was doing it probably to hide stuff, and it went on way too long, and some of the initial things should have shifted over to a better system, and it was stupid, and she's not very good at technology. Shouldn't have done it. Stupid. So today, Neera Tandon, who's a, a, a Clinton advisor, somebody I worked with in a, a later job, um, 
had um, a 2015 email to John Podesta get in the press. Can I, can I swear on record? The email said, this is fucking insane. That's from Hillary's advisor for the last 15 years. She shouldn't have done it. it was stupid. It's bad. But it's the kind of bad that a busy person just trying to make her life work might do. And it's not giving classified secrets to the enemy that you stole from a skiff. OK, so I'll stop there. So we've covered the future of Russia, America, nuclear attacks. We've covered emails. We've covered 12 other issues. I'll just open it for questions. And what do we want to do? Get to it. So questions out there? Yes? No? Wow. I, I, thought I, I thought I talked about something interesting. So, so <laughs> I will note that uh, if you go to Donald Trump's actual campaign website, he has a position on cybersecurity. Just noting. OK. So since you finished with email, let me continue it a little bit as a tech. I, I figured that's why I did it last, because you wouldn't have been thinking as, about anything else. As, as a technologist who yeah. wants to believe, right. or even if one wants to believe, the one totally specious argument that bothered a lot of us was this two-device argument in the sense that one can have multiple accounts on one device. Why did she continue for months, if not years, with this I didn't want to carry two-device argument? So there's a bunch of bad answers. One is my wife's answer, which is she doesn't have pockets, because men have pockets and women don't. Oh, you could have had one. To a second thing is, how, I mean, sandboxing on phones in a dependable way is, is not a great widely used technology. There's a, a lot more managed of stuff for that in cell now than there was in 2008 and 2009. And so yeah, I mean, look, you get a good technologist in, and this is your client, and you say, here's our menu of options, that would have been a better option, one, one device with, with segregated. But I'm not even sure you're allowed to have segregated on a government computer. Yeah, but I'm not sure you're allowed to have another account. I'm not sure if she was using her government device that she could have on that device a private account. I think that might still count as government, which is what she was trying not to do to that extent. So that's, that's at least a partial answer. That's a better than the pockets answer, I think. Are you calling on people still? Or am I? <laughs> Are you going to start calling on people? <laughs> no, 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 no. So I see one and two and three. OK. Oh, well, two, two went first. Go ahead. Um, so going back to something you said earlier about um, um, the Section 215 database being closed down and, and things of that nature, um, those are all secret programs. What is your sense of the follow through You know that they say they've closed it down and they've actually done it and that you know, yeah. th there isn't a bunch of stuff going on that we don't know about. Well, the, so what is the follow through and whether they closed it down? They closed it down. I'm at 100% on that. What is there's nothing else we don't know about? We're at 0% on that. There's all sorts of other stuff you don't know about. So, but, um, so I've written on this extensively. And if you go to peterswire.net, you can see lots of things about this. Um, one of the things we saw in the review group where we had top secret compartmentalized access and briefings and they answered everything we asked for was the NSA is a military operation and they follow the rules. You might disagree with the rules, but they, their compliance program, they have hundreds of compliance people. If they, they were finding in the 215 requests if people did a typo and they were reporting that to the FISA court eventually, not before 2009. They didn't have the big program. They built it up after 2009. So, our view was we had mission-driven, follow the rules people at the NSA, and the compliance program got built up a lot. And so I believe that they did what they said they were going to do on those specific things. Congress passed a statute. Congress statute said no 215 bulk collection, no FISA trap and trace bulk collection, no NSL bulk collection, national security letter. That's a statute. And if you're a lawyer or somebody operating at the NSA and you blow off that statute after Snowden, you're going to get crucified if you get found out. So that's a very risky place to be. And you're going to get all these people who are under orders to follow the law just itching to be the next whistleblower. So I, I, think, I think I have a lot more confidence after having spent time around the NSA that they do that than I would have before. Okay. Um, We're going to do three and then four. Okay. Do you think that there's space for anyone, FBI, manufacturer, to uh, go after the hundreds of thousands of vulnerable Internet of Things devices and brick <laughs> them as a, as a defensive move? 
oh, take down all the insecure things, have the FBI clean up the internet. Yeah, is there, any, uh, the is there any space in the law for that, for that to be legit? <laughs> I think usually the FBI trashing personal property is a problem. Right, you don't usually say, oh my God, there's a window with no bars over it, we have to break the glass. I mean, you know, <laughs> if somebody uh, uh, set up a, a, you know, an automatic rifle here that was like shooting randomly, you know, uh, then oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. someone would take that no, out, No, you can protect right? human life when it's, when it, I mean, and also there's, so you can do a issue? lot of things to stop bullets that you can't do because maybe it's gonna be used for a DDoS attack. I mean, so harm to people at that level is different from harm to property, which is what cyber attacks mostly still are. Look, there's a lot of things that should be done in the Internet of Things that are much better. And, um, we, we, um, and part of what, so we could do that whole list. I don't think that's our conversation today, but there's lots of, and it will change, but we're, we're sort of in the early stages, and we, we're going to have to yell and scream for a while, and then we'll have rules, and then we'll have penalties, basically. But on the hack back, the idea that when Comcast, as an ISP, is letting through the DDoS attack, when the University of Michigan has some open parts of its computing, maybe, who knows, I don't know, but Saul's trying to close them down. The university no, 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 let's be clear, no, I'm not. <laughs> say it again? No. No, there, is, there are other only universities. Where or let me say only where, where appropriate. Right, so, so there's, we like our but, networks. so there's a temptation to do something to the stupid people who are letting the burglars in, but breaking their computers is not, is almost for sure not the right answer, in, in my view but it, it leaves us with this uncomfortable lack of things. Oh, I had, okay. There was an order. There was an order, and I'm, yep. I, the order was one and two and so, three. So who else, who else? What's your the name? gentleman in the gray sweater, and I'm trying to sort of keep a rough order so people don't get, yeah, okay. Um, thank you for this nice overview of the different viewpoints of the candidates. Um, what do you think are issues that are lacking from this list? What, what is kind of being neglected in the privacy and cybersecurity space? Um, You know, so the, this document by the ITIF, I thought did a good job of seeing what the tech issues, the information technology issues are, and doing a, a pro and con on it. Um, I, I'm not, nothing's coming to my mind as obviously missing from it. You're asking what's sort of around the corner they're not talking about yet. From your experience. Yeah, I, I, I don't have a great answer on that. So I'll just say nothing comes to mind. I'm sorry. Or maybe lack of imagination. The woman in the black here. Uh, thank you. Uh, so previously you mentioned that email servers have a pre-scheduled time in which emails get deleted. Yeah, deletion schedule. But right. there is an article about the e server guy for Clinton actually asked Reddit on how to permanently delete emails. It was in Washington Post and it was about uh, Paul Kambata and he was actually the email server yeah. guy, tech guy for well, Clinton. So so I have two observations. One is, if your job is to do something, take out the trash, delete the emails, then I want you to do it successfully. You don't want the trash to be strewn on the driveway. You don't want the emails to be half deleted if that's your job. So it makes total sense to me that somebody whose job is to delete the email should do it right. Now, asking Reddit how the heck to do it, just as a, as a procedure for getting really, really good advice, I don't know. What? <laughs> you know, so, so th that suggests that it wasn't an ace, fabulous person doing it, if that's the tool. But, I mean, it's, it's actually really hard to delete. We talk about this in my privacy and cybersecurity classes. Because if you do a standard delete, it deletes a little header at the beginning of the file and the rest of it's sitting there. So the usual way to delete is, what, if, it's, if it's software, is to overwrite it with random ones and zeros multiple times and it takes a lot of time for each file. The other way to do it, is to basically blow up the disk physically. That, that's another good way to destroy it. But, you know, people don't have like disk blow up facilities around their house all the time. So he should, if he's got a job, he should do it right. And I don't blame him for trying to learn how to do it. It just sounds like he wasn't very good at it. Does that answer the? It's just the time that he asked his question was when Clinton was heavily bombarded. There, this is sort of like Benghazi. I, I was interested enough in it to learn the first 23 allegations and the answers to it, but not enough to go to the extra 50 allegations. So on email, there's a bunch of things I've learned and studied, but the exact timeline of each thing and whether somebody did stuff wrong, I don't have that in my head. So I don't, I don't know. I, I, there are people who've given answers back and forth, but I don't have that in my head. Yeah. I, 
almost feel bad about And then it'll be next, yeah. No, go ahead. Yeah. I almost feel bad about taking the conversation out of politics, but I was just wondering your, uh, about your thoughts about consumer protection, legislative efforts, especially given your background. On privacy in, and stuff? In, yes, like do not track. Uh, so <laughs> yeah. uh, do you have updates in your, in your thought process? Do you think there is an option forward? Is right. it actually going to happen at some point? Does it have to happen? Yeah. So I spend a lot of time working on European privacy data protection laws where Europe has a very comprehensive privacy set of rules. And the United States has a lot of privacy rules, including today the FCC announced, Federal Communications Commission announced, a great big set of new privacy rules today, October 27th, this morning, 3 to 2 vote, 26, whatever, um, that will say, for instance, if AT&T is able to buy Time Warner, and who knows if they will, that AT&T and Time Warner would not be able to share the data about customers between the two parts of it. That's, that's basically what the rule said today. Unless you as a customer say, yes, I agree to it. And also one of the rules says AT&T can't have a different price if you, to make you agree to it. So you'd have to voluntarily say, yeah, I'd rather have the stuff shared. So the US has HIPAA. We have the financial privacy, gram leach Bliley. We have this FCC rule about the, IS, the internet service providers and the phone companies. We have a lot of law. Saul and I were co-authors of the first edition of a book in 2005 on US private sector privacy law. The third edition will come out this year. It's way over 200 pages long. We have tons of law in the United States. Um, will there be a comprehensive new statute in the United States? Pretty hard to do. Um, Europe's tried to force us to do that by saying you've got to be up to the European standards, and that hasn't succeeded. So I think it's pretty hard to get the comprehensive statute. We tend to be better if we see a problem. Drones are flying in your living room. Let's pass a drone law. I think we, if we have problems with drones, we'll pass drone laws. But I think saying that all US data processing is always going to be regulated, I think that's going to be very hard to pass. And security, so I guess you know, the third parties sharing information with each other and not creating basically a small world where you, know, you have just one, you need one person to fail to be able to, for bad people to get the data. Look, I, you know, I think, so security I tend to think of as uh, the rules to try to stop the bad guys from getting in when they're not authorized. So we have data breach laws in the United States. In fact, Europe is copying our laws for that. That'll go into effect in Europe in 2018. Um, there's a lot of discussion about the Federal Trade Commission and whether it should have more influence over commercial, including an Internet of Things, security. And we might start saying to people, if you don't come up to some basic level of security, you're going to be on the hook for the failures. So I think that's an easier law to get in the United States than saying to a social network that you can't sort of play with the data about the individuals who went to the social network. That's a relatively hard law to pass in the United States. Um, we had one in back, and then we have a line other behind. No? And then back to the first email, gentlemen. OK. The Obama administration put in place uh, a bunch of new cybersecurity infrastructure, both on the military national defense side as well as the non-military side. I hope so. In eight years, you ought to be upgrading. I'm sorry? During eight years, you ought to be doing something on cybersecurity. Yeah. OK. And, and so uh, I'm interested in your thoughts on the top two or three priorities for the next administration related to cybersecurity right. and its intersection with privacy. Yep. Is there a need for Congress to do something statutorily that has not happened during the Obama administration? Uh, but what, what would be the top two or three priorities right. if you were recommending it to the next administration? Great question. So um, the president has, a, has named a 12-member commission on enhancing national cybersecurity. Uh, their report is due December 1st. Um, and um, I'm watching this with interest because one of the commissioners is my wife. <laughs> Annie Anton, who's a professor at Georgia Tech, she's a computer security. We met in the privacy cybersecurity nerd context and later we got married. Um, so uh, she's spending a lot of her time working on that and I don't see the draft. Um, and, but I have, a, I, I have a lot of confidence in the quality of the people. They have a really even apart from my views about my wife, which are highly positive, <laughs> um, the, 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 there's a range of other really, the, 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 the CEO of MasterCard has got great tech credentials, the, the chief information security person for, for Uber. They've got a whole bunch of different people who are really good at it. So my first answer would be read the report because I haven't been spending all my time coming up with that. Um, a, a few things. I think Internet of Things is a disaster right now. And 
the, we're repeating the mistakes of the 1990s. In the 1990s, when people started using the internet for commerce all the time, the software game was, uh, we've got to get out there and get market share and be first to market and have features and have coolness so that we become the dominant player in our niche. And once we get big, we'll figure out how to go do the security afterwards. And that led to all the bad security stuff we had to fix in the 2000s, including Microsoft locking down Microsoft for a period of time just to go back and patch all the mistakes about 2003 or whatever. Uh, that's happening in the Internet of Things. They're trying to get the cool stuff out there and trying to get it to market and trying to get it to be easy and trying to get it to be quick and not doing security. And we can just, we've seen this movie. We know what their incentives are and they're putting out bad stuff that you can't even patch and update that will be installed for years to come and it's really bad. So if I was going to push somewhere, I'd be pushing to make it harder to do the stupid on the Internet of Things. That would be high in my level for sort of commercial kind of things. Um, I, you know, there's, there's a ton of other projects. I, I, I'll, I think that the administration has, has done a good, I'll call it bureaucratic job, step by step of building up cybersecurity. So there's something NIST does as national standards. There's the NIST cybersecurity framework that came out a couple years ago. And it tells small businesses and medium-sized businesses and big businesses what it takes to have a mature cybersecurity program on all of the right dimensions. And I assign it to my students in like the first couple of weeks of class every semester because it pretty much tells you what, what you ought to be doing in your organization. So we actually have a national blueprint for what people should be doing in their organizations. And pushing that to happen sooner is something a lot of companies are doing. Um, so that's pretty good. There's been more information sharing, but it's really tricky because if I share all the data from my database with you, it's a privacy problem. And how to get the right sharing and not is a really hard, nuanced kind of game. Um, so, um, and then I'm, I have a personal research project on something obscure that I'll just mention briefly is something that has to get fixed. Um, has anybody here ever heard of an MLAT? M Mutual Legal Assistance Treaty. Okay, this is obscure. I'm going to try to make it so you care just a little bit, and, and this has got to be fixed. So let's say that for a moment that you were a police officer and pick your favorite European country, wherever you want to go. You're, you're, you're Nice, France, and there's a crime. Some American has been burglared. But um, all, of the all of the evidence is an email that's held by Google or by Microsoft or something in the United States. In the old days, if you want to do the investigation in Nice, France, you'd get all the evidence locally. But we have globalized data. So now it's an international incident for the cops in Nice, France, to get Mountain View to send them the email. And to do that, roughly speaking, the cops have to get a judge in France to go to Paris and say we need it, to go to Washington to the Department of Justice to say we need it, to go to the Northern District of California to say we need it, to serve a request on Google. And if they do it, then it goes back all the way, sort of slowly, to Nice, France. It's a bad way to do crime fighting. And there's a lot of reasons why we're careful for privacy and sovereignty about letting the cops in Nice get everything about Americans. But it's crazy for a burglary or, or ordinary crime in Nice to take a year or more to actually get the basic documents to do the investigation. So I'm working on this big project, lots of articles already written, there'll probably be a book, that will say how do we reform this so we have globalized data and national criminal laws, how do we reform it so we can adjust to the fact that data is all over the world and crimes still happen locally. That's something that should be fixed, it's actually something that's on Secretary Clinton's list, she approves MLAT reform. Uh, I, because it takes so long to explain it and to walk across the room. I didn't include it in my list earlier. But that's one of these problems that shows technology keeps moving, globalized data, and the legal system has to catch up. And so I, hope, I would hope in the next four years we'd have progress on that one. Okay? So we have time for one last question. Is there anybody who hasn't asked a question because he got one try? Let's go to the back, sir. I'm just, just out of a sort of fairness, you know, let all the students talk and stuff like that. Yeah. Go ahead. A small continuation on what you were just saying yeah. is, is there any work being done to create a more unified state cyber law? Well, is state data breach states? law. You think can the state step in and do stuff? Well, I, I want to know, state laws vary so much on 
what is criminal and what is not sure. criminal yeah. uh, when it involves the internet. And so many things, since the internet doesn't have the same physical space, can cross state lines. Yep. And is the federal government trying to work towards having more unified state laws without taking away the state's ability to govern themselves? Right, so the federalism, what's the role of the state? What's the role of the federal government? Um, so there's one state that's way out there with more laws than anyone else, California. California's got, you know, depending how you count, six or a dozen extra laws around the internet that other states don't have. And they're trying to figure out how to, how to push things along. I think the states have often been a laboratory of experimentation on some of these issues. There were state anti-spam laws and eventually we got a federal spam law. There were state data breach laws and they're effectively governing nationally because we haven't been able to pass one in Congress. So I think having states try things and see which ones work is by and large pretty good in this area. Um, that clearly can be bad, there can be dumb laws that stop ordinary businesses from being able to operate in a state because some legislatures passed a stupid law. So there's plenty of state laws I wouldn't like. But I think that the US system tends to be that states can do stuff unless Congress has clearly preempted, unless Congress has said, now we own this space, like the can spam law owns the space. And especially because it's so hard to do things in Washington, I think having experiments at the state level is really important. Now, you asked a slightly different question, which is then, how do you get all the states to agree without doing it through Congress? That's pretty hard. The, you know, politics differ between the 50 states, pretty much. Um, so I think I tend to see it as experimentation the good ones maybe get copied in Washington is more the way we've tended to, to do some of this. So I'll stay around for a little bit afterwards, but uh, thanks for your attention and go out and vote. And uh, thanks very much. So speaking of voting, thank you, Peter Swire. Uh, I encourage you all to join us next week, a week before the election on Tuesday, we'll be having another dissonance event with faculty members from the College of Engineering and LSNA in the Department of Statistics, hosted by Doug Trabu from Michigan Radio, where we're gonna be talking about hacking the election and disrupting democracy. You hear a lot about the election is rigged. I think we're gonna examine that pretty hard next Tuesday evening. So I hope to see you there.